I am Dr. Nandor Fodor, the world's foremost parapsychologist. I am not a skeptic. This is the strangest case I have ever encountered. A family living in a farmhouse claim a talking mongoose lives in their barn. The creature's name is Jeff. What do you think about them? A talking mongoose. The Irving family are peculiar. Did you observe this creature? No. No. I did hear it. We are going to the Isle of Man. I have almost 20 years of research in this field. You're here to see Jeff. Is the creature here? Well, because we can't see him, doesn't mean he ain't here. I see. The daughter is a ventriloquist. Dr. Fodor has a tremendous skepticism. Indeed. This is an inexplicable force. You'd say the wee rascal's probably watching us right now. Everybody on this island has their Jeff story. Tell me yours. You and I both know. There ain't no Jeff. Can you tell him to come out so we can see him? Is that him there? What is the Irving's motive? It strike me as con artists. We hear it with our eyes as much as we do our ears. These people are lying. I think he exists. I'm certain of it. Just show yourself. I mean you no harm. Please. Jeff! Just show me that you're real. Dr. Fodor, there's a call for you. This from him. H Hello? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we are so excited today to have with us writer, director of Nandor Fodor and the Talking Mongoose, Adam Siegel. Adam, say what's up. How's it going? What's up? Hey, and so we're here to talk about your new movie, Nandor Fodor and the Talking Mongoose, which follows, well, a doctor named Nandor Fodor. He's a Hungarian doctor, played by the brilliant Simon Pegg. He goes to the Isle of Man to investigate the po a possible talking mongoose. Um, he takes his assistant, Annie, played by the lovely Mini Driver, with him. And what they discover is more than they bargained for, I would say. Uh, what the hell made you want to write this movie? You know, it's funny. I heard about this story first about 10 years ago, very randomly on the radio. And it was like, yeah, this is the Nandor Fodor. And he investigated a talking mongoose on the Isle of Man. I was like, what? what? Did I just hear that? And so I would always, as I made other movies, would tell people, oh, one day I'm going to write this talking mongoose movie. And it wasn't until I sort of peripherally experienced through like a friend, a very strange, like religious experience that suddenly it hit me and I was like, oh my God, I'm going to marry these. Like Jeff is God. Here we go. Like, and, and I figured it out. And, and cause I never have been interested in just doing like a, like a standard biopic. I needed more. And so that was it. I love that. I wanted yeah. to, I noticed a funny trend. We'll get it. We'll get more into that. What you just said in a minute here, but one of your early films is called Astral Man, right? Oh man. That was a TV series that I wrote. Right. Very, very, yeah. It, it never went anywhere, but yeah. Right. And then in your last film, Chariot, you worked with Thomas Mann. All right. There's a lot of mans. And what aisle does this take place in? The Isle of Man. Oh, my God. You're right. It's very, maybe I just like secretly, it's like toxic masculinity, like coming then, out in my film. Dude, you're just the man. <laughs> I am the man. That, that's is. the other way of saying it, too. Now, yes. I, uh, I, I really thought that you did a great job of telling the story. The writing is actually really, really good. Like, I love the script Thank a you. lot. I, I loved hearing the words coming out of Simon's mouth because I don't, I'm not used to hearing something so serious and so, uh, yeah. so unrelentingly paltry come out of his mouth. Usually he's saying something and it's ridiculous or stupid. Yeah. So for yeah. him to be saying some, I... some profound existential stuff. It was pretty weird. Yeah, but awesome. Simon. But he's great in the movie. Yeah, he's so good. Why? Why? Oh, did, how amazing. did you get this cast? Because you have Christopher Lloyd, you have 
Yeah. Simon, Peggy, have many driver. How did you end up getting all these? Simon was the first. Stuff? Simon was the first domino man, and it's crazy. Like I've told this story, and it's so funny because, like, the you know, I've made five features now, and if there's one thing I can say, and everybody knows this who's in the industry, the hardest thing to do is to attach big stars to little movies. It just is. It's it's almost impossible. So usually, what you do, you send the you send the script and an offer to the agent, and they ignore you, and you never hear anything, and then that's it. So with this one, sent him the script, agent texted us or emailed about three weeks later, said Simon loves it. He wants to Zoom. I got on a Zoom. We talked about it for about an hour, had a very intelligent conversation about it. He said, I'm in, let's do it. I was like, oh, okay. It was like, almost like I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop. I was like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. no, but it was perfect. And then once Simon was in, everybody wants to do a movie with Simon. So then it was like, you know, Minnie came in and all these lovely British supporting actors and then Christopher and yeah. Yeah. Ruthie and Tim and Paul and Gary, all these amazing actors. Do you know how you know you wrote a good script? How's that? You got Neil Gaiman to voice a character who's not on screen ever. Yeah. So Neil, Neil actually told me he, he, you know, when I went out and met with him and, and we did the VO, you know, he, when we first met, he said, Oh man, he said, I read the script. It's brilliant. And, and that, like, it was just a throwaway thing he said. And I, but that like stuck with me because this is one of my childhood idols. And this is like, you know, one of the greatest writers, I think out there at the, at he's this literally point, one point. of the greatest writers alive. And he said, I your script was completely. good. So you must yeah. be doing something. <laughs> no, I'll take it. No. And he knew the story of Jeff and like knew all the lore of the mongoose and stuff. And so it was great. Like he played with it. He loved it. He was super excited. And he's such a lovely, lovely guy. That's so awesome because him and his wife are so creative and so beautifully oh, creative. Yeah. Like They're Amanda's amazing. a br- brilliant songwriter and he's a brilliant yeah. novelist slash movie writer. Yeah. And he's just brilliant. And so that's how I knew. And I didn't know this until just momentarily uh, that he, that he was in the movie. But I, I yeah. looked it up and I was like, no way, dude. That, that means that I'm right when about my feelings on the script. It validates the my feelings. Oh, people know that. It's crazy. So there you go. I love that. I love that. And like I said, I really enjoyed the film. And I don't want to say too much because I don't want to spoil the surprise of what it is and what's happening and the craziness that, that's ensuing. So I won't talk too much about uh, Just know that it's going to be a very, very interesting review for me to write. Um, Amazing. I wanted to ask you two questions I ask all my guests and they're about you. And this is, this is where we get to kind of get to know you, Adam, because this is the first time you're on with us. Yeah. Hopefully not the last. Hopefully not. First question we always ask is who are some people that inspire you, whether that be in your personal life or, you know, in the, in, as a director or writer. Uh, definitely one of my, my biggest inspirations as an artist is David Lynch. Um, I ha- just think he's the greatest storyteller of our time. I think he's one of the, one of the guys out there that, that tell stories in a way that nobody else quite does. And he prioritizes theme and emotion more so than a linear narrative in the most like dramatic way possible. And he's, he's been one of my biggest inspirations as an artist for sure. There's it's tons so, of people, but, but he, he's probably number one. It's so funny you say that because our podcast this month, we're actually doing a director retrospect on David Lynch. We're going to be talking about all his movies. So if you want to come on, uh, I would absolutely love there as long as you have time because I will talk for a long time oh, about no, Lynch. Our, I'm very <laughs> our last podcast was three hours long. You got plenty of time, Adam. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect because especially about Twin Peaks and about you know just how that man tells stories. There's just nobody like him. I'll send you a DM and we'll see if we can get absolutely. you. Absolutely, yeah. DM about- me on Instagram. I, that's usually where I kind of communicate and stuff. But yeah, I would love to do that. That sounds awesome. I think you'd have a good time. And we usually have a really good time on the podcast. And then, so I'm glad you did that. So the second question we always ask everybody is if you had two movies that you had to watch for the rest of your life, what would they be and why? Um, well, Raising Arizona is the film that got that made me want to be a filmmaker because it was the first film I saw uh, as a kid, I came from a very prose background of like loving like classic novels and sh- fantasy like Tolkien and Shakespeare. So, and, and, and I love movies and I'd never seen such a seamless marriage of very intelligent dialogue with contemporary filmmaking. I just never seen, I didn't know you could write to get your actors to say these unbelievably intelligent lines. And so I saw it as a, like a late teen, uh, uh, you know, maybe early twenties. And I was like, oh my God. 
So that's one. And then the other one's probably, you know, probably my favorite film of all time is The Thin Red Line, uh, Malik's Thin Red Line. And it's just so beautiful that I could watch it. It's so rich and there's so much to it. So those would be the two. I love that because you chose a director, a set of directors who I obviously envy in, in the Coens. And I, I, they were so brilliant. And I'm not a Terrence Malick fan, but Thin Red Line is one of the only films I can sit through. And so I love Malick, that you that. His, To be fair, it's erratic. You know, they, they're, some of his movies, especially his most recent few, I haven't been able to make it through. But The New World and Badlands and Days of Heaven and The Thin Red Line, I think are pretty brilliant. You gave all the good ones right there because the yeah, last like exactly. three or four have been kind of yeah. hard to get through. <laughs> no, I'm on the same page. I love that. I love those choices. I love Raising Arizona. What a great movie. Oh, what a brilliant it, script for such dumb characters. <laughs> I literally I was with a girl recently and she hadn't seen it and was able to rewatch it. I rewatch it probably once or twice a year. And it's, it's so brilliant. I pick things up even now. I mean, just the, the, the dialogue is just so, and even like Miller's crossings, another example of it too, you know, just like they're, they're just writing on another level. They, they just don't care about dumbing it down for their audience, which is so beautiful. Well, it's a great balance of mixing these dumb characters with this smart script to make the dumb exactly. characters seem even dumber. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Beautiful. They yeah, do it throughout their whole uh, whole filmography, the Cohen. So I'm glad okay. you picked them. And I can see a little bit of Cohenism in your script, where it's like oh, these man. characters are so dumb in yeah. the Isle of Man, but they just don't care. No, it's true. That's my. I aspire to make something, you know, like that at some point in my career I, I those are the, to me they are definitely some of the most brilliant filmmakers out there and that and that point that arrow makes near the end of the movie where the point he makes to nandor it's like yeah <laughs> exactly dude scene. i know like that's my favorite scene just because it's so funny and it's just you see him destroying nandor just destroying him and with nothing and destroying but but just destroying him telling him the truth and telling him what he needs to hear and and it just you see and simon you see simon's soul just die in that scene his performance is so great it's it's, it's a beautiful really it's a beautiful non-verbal performance for the most part by simon Pegg. it really is oh, and no i question. thought gary beetle he's just laying it into gary him and i amazing. love that yeah. scene man that's yeah, yeah I, that's one it's of my beautiful. favorite scenes in the whole movie and i, I really enjoyed the movie. I wanted to tell you, I really enjoyed it. And I, I didn't know what to expect when it came across my desk. This is coming out September 19th, which happens to be my birthday. Oh yeah. That's on streaming. It's in theaters now. It, you know, I know they don't prioritize that that much, but it is still, it is in theaters. It came out on the first, I was able to watch it. We did a kind of a screening premiere in LA. We had about 400 people and seeing it on the big screen was really great. It was really the cool. Pro the problem is a lot of our audience is in places where they can't see it. We don't get oh, a lot of course. LA and New York audiences. We get a lot of because I, I live in Columbus, so like it's probably playing oh, it's at the Columbus, gateway. Man. It's, it's, it's at there. the gateway, it's, probably. Yeah, yeah, it's it's in a lot of uh, it, you know it's out there in a, in a number of places, but yeah, but on demand. Hey, look, everybody watches stuff at home. It's not like a big. It's not Oppenheimer. You know, you'll be okay watching it on your home theater. It'll be good. It's a great movie, and I really think everybody should check it out. Now, I want you to give me the elevator pitch on why they should check out Nandor Fodor and the Talking Mongoose, besides the fact that there's a Talking Mongoose in the movie. So. Yeah, I mean, Talking Mongoose, Simon Pegg, Minnie Driver, Christopher Lloyd, Neil Gaiman. How could it be bad with this cast, honestly? Like, just get these guys. These guys could sit around just drinking water and looking at each other, and it would still be engaging. But the, there is a lot to see here. There's a strange mix of uh, Cohen writing almost Wes Anderson cinematography and shoot style. And I love that. And it's a weird, Those are strange two movie. big influences on my filmmaking for sure. And my DP, I mean, her name's Sarah Dean. She's phenomenal. I mean, she did such a great job and it looks so beautiful and so much better than, you know, the amount of money that was spent on it. She makes it look like, you know, pretty fantastic. I was going to say it looked fantastic. Uh, Sarah deserves a, a shout out for be, making it look so good. Now, where can people follow you um, if they want to harass you about this movie and how good it is? Just Instagram. That's the only place I'm actually really active. It's Soaring Seagull. And I post a lot about my films and stupid memes and put lots of pictures of David Lynch and his movies. So perfect. Yeah. yeah. Love it. And hopefully we'll be able to get you on the podcast sometime this I'd week. I'd love to, man. Talk about David fun. Lynch. Ladies and gentlemen, down. the director of Nandor Fordor and the Talking Mongoose starring Simon Pegg, Adam Siegel. Say goodbye to everybody. 
Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. Thanks, William. For Film Snob Reviews, this is William. And we'll see you next time, Adam. We'll see you on the podcast, hopefully. (laughs) All right. See ya.